We are in the most recently installed permanent exhibit in the American History Museum. It's called On the Water. I started when I was a little kid watching a show called Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges. And when I was uh, 13, I started scuba diving. During college, I worked for a dive shop on Nantucket and then uh, met up an archaeologist who was actually a terrestrial archaeologist doing land stuff. And then I learned about this discipline where people were studying shipwrecks all over the world, sort of Sherlock Holmes type, figuring out the clues. I think the public's always been fascinated, really. It's uh, any kind of disaster tends to attract attention. Certainly the Titanic still has an incredible amount of interest in it. And people are saying, well, is the Smithsonian going to celebrate the, the sinking of the Titanic? And uh, I said, well, we have some material on exhibit, but we don't exactly celebrate disasters. Although I've devoted much of my career to other people's mistakes and problems and disasters. One of the shipwrecks I worked on is, is displayed right around the corner. It's a uh, shipwreck from Lake Superior. The Smithsonian recovered machinery from it, namely the boiler, the propeller, and the engine back in the 1970s. And then I took a crew back up there in the early 1990s and we documented the ship more thoroughly. Cataloging the objects once they come up, photographing them, all those kinds of things are, are part of the job when you're on an expedition. We train divers, particularly in archaeological methods, that uh, we, there might be a diver who knows how to scuba dive, but he won't necessarily know how to measure objects or, or what degree of accuracy we need underwater. We'll teach them how to sketch. And I remember one of the things that I learned when I was first beginning to scuba dive was the instructor handed me a board, one nail, and a hammer, and he said, put the nail on the board. And so, of course, you're flailing around underwater when you're first starting out, and the board floated up and the nail sank, and I couldn't find it, and the hammer was still in my hand, and I had nothing to do with it. We're using uh, state-of-the-art uh, GPS, for example, and DGPS, actually, to locate wrecks and to uh, pinpoint them. You'll find that, that most archaeologists want to use the garden hoses and the paper clips. Uh, because when you're in a very remote part of the world and you can't replace some kind of an electronic machine or an instrument that might go on the haywire, then uh, you always have to fall back on the simplest, uh, easiest things that you can use. That was a, uh, the ship that was a, a very early ship that was built in Salem, Massachusetts, right after the War of 1812. It was built by one of the richest fellows in America, George Crown and Shield. It was a luxury ship. This was a boat that cost in 1816 dollars $100,000. It was the first deep water American yacht ever built. And he only got to take one voyage on it before he died. He took one trip to the Mediterranean and then he died and the ship was sold to his brother who then sold it to some China traders in Boston. They in turn sold it to the King of Hawaii. So the King of Hawaii used it for about four years and the crew of the Royal Yacht uh, had a little too much to drink and a squall came up and the anchor cable parted and it wrecked up on a reef in Hanalei Bay on the island of Kauai. This particular ship took about five summers to excavate. Probably the most interesting thing is the conjoining of the native Hawaiian material and the western material. This was a period when western culture was coming into the Pacific, mainly through the whaling fleet but also through the China trade. And we found evidence of all of that on board this vessel. I'm. Uh, going to be heading down to Cuba fairly soon to look for an American slave ship. And the ship was coming back from a trip to Africa under chase by a British anti-slaving patrol vessel and hit a reef on the north shore of Cuba. And I think what's important about it is one, it was an American slave ship. The entire cargo, the human cargo, was lost. Everyone, all the slaves perished. However, the crew survived. We don't know why. And two, it actually sank on the middle passage. No American slave ship has ever been found, and no, um, no slave ship of any nationality that was actually on a middle passage voyage with the human cargo has ever been found. So we hope to find it and make a real contribution to our modern knowledge of our, of our slaving heritage. I've always tried to devote my energies to wrecks that will make a real contribution, wrecks that, that had some unique factor.